the secret to summer-ready skin is here. Osea's number one best-selling Andaria Algae Body Oil, clinically proven to instantly improve skin elasticity and transform dry skin to silky, soft, and unbelievably glowing. Its signature scent of freshly squeezed grapefruit, cypress, and mango mandarin transports you to sun-kissed summer days. Get healthy, glowing skin for summer with clean, vegan skincare from Osea. Get 10% off your first order site-wide with code GLOW at oseamalibu.com. You're listening to the Sisters in Loss podcast, a faith-based grief and loss podcast for Black women, where you will hear stories of miscarriage, infant loss, stillbirth, and infertility to learn there is a testimony in tragedy. You will learn how to heal, gain clarity, find hope and peace, and turn your pain into your purpose after loss. I'm your host, Erica M. McAfee. Thank you so much, Crystal, for being on the podcast. Thank you. So I'd like to begin with you sharing a little bit about yourself and what you do. Okay, I am 39 years old and I'm a clinical social worker and I specialize in sexual trauma. And I've been working with veterans and military members since about 2008. And I believe I've been a clinical social worker since 2005. It seems like time is flying. But yes, since 2005, like I said, 39 and no children. And I currently live in Houston. Awesome. So take us back on your journey to motherhood and share with us your love story. Okay. So it was, as I said, I'm 39. And when I was, became pregnant, I was 38. I've never been pregnant before. I don't have any children. And so I've always wanted to be a mother, but it just never happened. I don't know why it's kind of like life and I was okay with it, but yet it was still a huge desire of mine. And I just wasn't sure, you know, that biological clock was ticking, but it did happen. And it was in August. And even though my, uh, my partner and I, we weren't trying at the time, we weren't doing anything to not have it happen. If you know what I mean? So when it happened, I was excited. I was nervous. I remember when I took the test and I said that I was positive. I remember I laid on the couch and like stared at the wall for hours and not out of fear or anything. I think I was just in shock. And I immediately started telling everyone and he started telling everyone. And sometimes I think maybe I shouldn't have done that. I don't know. You know, hindsight is twenty twenty. And I was already told that I would be, I would have a high risk pregnancy because of my age, one, and because I have a history of blood clots. So those were things that I knew that were kind of working against me. And I was trying very hard to be positive. But I, now that I look back at it, I, I know that I just had this fear that something would go wrong. But yet I never thought that I would miscarry. I, I know that's weird to say I had a fear, but I just I just never thought that I would. I, I didn't think that I would be included in those numbers. And so, like I said, we started telling people right away, and that was in August. And our first doctor's appointment, the doctor said that it looked like twins, but she felt like one wasn't going to make it. And I didn't know how I felt about that. I wasn't expecting twins. My boyfriend already has twins. And so he would joke that he thought I was pregnant with twins, but I never thought that I would be pregnant with twins. I mean, it just never crossed my mind. So when she said that, I didn't know how to feel. And she said, you know, we'll come back on your next appointment, which would have been in September, and we'll go from there. But as for the one baby, she felt that everything was looking good and you know, we were excited. I was still nervous, but I thought everything would be fine. So I thought that our the next appointment, we would just we would just try to see if I was having twins or not. But the night before my doctor's appointment, I started cramping really badly and I just felt odd. I felt weird. I felt like something was wrong, but I really didn't want to speak it because I didn't want to speak negatively over my life. I didn't want to jinx it. And it was my first pregnancy, so I wasn't sure. But I just I just didn't feel right. And so uh, my boyfriend and I, we went to the doctor and before the doctor could even say anything, I just started crying. I was like, you don't see anything. And I just remember her saying, Crystal, I'm really sorry. And I just remember the most piercing cry that I've ever had in my life. And I just, uh, I just, just thinking about it gives me chills because I can sometimes hear my own cry. and. I was pretty devastated. My boyfriend was devastated. He'd never gone through it before. 
I just thought everything was going to be okay. And uh, before that appointment, we got the results, like, you know, the levels and they test your levels, the HCG, everything was looking perfect. My progesterone was high because that was the issue as well. Everything was looking good. So I never thought that I was going to hear that news. And so we were pretty devastated. And I, I definitely was devastated. I I felt betrayed by God. I couldn't understand it. Like, why I wait all this time? I'm 38 years old. And, well, 39 by the time that I lost the baby because I had a birthday. I'm 39. I'm excited. It's never happened before. And this is the fate. This is what happened. I just felt betrayed. I felt useless. I didn't feel like a woman. I felt broken. I, I felt I didn't feel human. I remember telling my mother that when I became pregnant, I felt like I, I had a purpose. And, you know, she would say that I, I shouldn't feel that way, that you have a purpose without being a mom. But I, I'm not going to take that statement back. I did. When I became pregnant, it, it, everything became about my child. I was eating better, drinking more water. Everything just became, I want to see my baby. So I, I did. I felt like I had a purpose. And so I felt like it was snatched away from me and I had no choice. And I like to be in control. And you quickly learn that you really have no control of it. You can try, you can do everything, quote unquote, right. But what's going to happen is going to happen. And that was devastating for me in itself. Because like I said, I like control. I've, you know, my career, my education, I, I've been able to, to do it. And here, here comes this and something that I've wanted literally all of my life. I remember being a, a five-year-old little girl saying I wanted to be a mom and there was nothing that I could do to stop it. And so I remember at the doctor's office, she asked, the doctor asked if I wanted to do the DNC or take the pill to complete the miscarriage at home. I remember asking, you know, which procedure would be easier or like quicker. And she said, like, the DNC. So I chose the DNC. I didn't want to be at home and not knowing when the when it would start. And I remember asking God, like, please don't let me start bleeding at home. I knew I couldn't handle that. I don't know how I knew that I couldn't handle it, but I knew that I couldn't. I knew I couldn't see that. So and thank God I did not that entire weekend. I, I didn't bleed. I just, you know, kind of laid around. But unfortunately, I, I became extremely depressed before the procedure. Unfortunately, the DNC, the procedure was on my boyfriend's birthday. So I felt terrible about that. But again, no choice, no control. <laughs> so just I felt terrible about that. So I became very, very depressed. And I remember telling my boyfriend that I was going to complete suicide. I was serious. I was very serious. I was very matter of fact about it. He couldn't believe it. He's already experienced that his brother completed suicide years ago when he was younger. And I meant it. And, and I... I, I won't try to cover that up. I meant it. I was very serious about it. And, and I just felt like there was no use. You know, I had done my career. I'd been a great mother. I was sorry, a great daughter, a great friend. And I just wanted to be a mother. And that was snatched from me. So I just felt like, what's the point? I wasn't trying to hurt him. I wasn't trying to hurt my mother, my friends, or my father. I just, I was done. I was tired. I was heartbroken. And so I recall, because he works nights, and so I recall him not going to work that weekend, you know, those nights. I remember him staying with me. And then the night before the procedure, because the procedure was on the Tuesday, so that Monday night, I remember taking pills. I was home alone. I remember taking pills because, you know, I had antidepressants and Ambien because I'd already had insomnia before. So I had those. And I remember, because we don't drink, but I remember there was like some type of old beer in the fridge. And I remember getting that in the, in like the ambient and the antidepressant. I remember getting those and taking it. I don't remember much else. I remember being on the phone talking to my boyfriend and then somehow I remember him being in the house. I'm assuming I let him in. Didn't have a key. So I'm assuming I let him in. And... Now that I think of it, I remember arguing with him and being in the kitchen and attempting to take more pills. I don't remember much after that. Sometimes when I'm like driving now, I'll get little flashbacks, but I don't remember much. And then the next day was the procedure. And of course, he went with me. My mother was there. And so I had the procedure, came home. 
And I didn't really remember everything that happened the night before. And my mother mentioned to me that, you know, it's, it's, she could tell something was wrong with my boy, my boyfriend, but she just figured it was, you know, me losing the baby. She figured he was just grieving. She had no clue. She did tell me that she remembers that when she came over to my house and he opened the door, she was like, oh, I thought you were meeting us there. And he gave her some weird excuse. And she thought it was strange. Like, wait, what are you, what are you doing here? But again, she just kind of, you know, flicked it off or whatever. And so after the procedure was on a Tuesday, I remember arguing with him again on that Thursday about, you know, like there was no help. He's like, I think you need to go to, you know, see a therapist. And I am a therapist, but I was like, no, there's no need for that. And again, there, there goes me being matter of fact, you know, and he was just hurt. And, you know, it was a very, very rough time uh, for he and I just, you know, on top of, um, of losing the baby, then it was my suicide attempt. Maybe a week later, we went to therapy. I did make a therapy appointment. And right before the therapy appointment, he gave me more details on, on what I tried to do. And I was devastated. You know, my therapist, I she was wide eyed about it. Once, you know, he began to tell her details. So apparently when he did come over the night before, I was basically out of my mind because I had been drinking and taking Ambien and antidepressants. Apparently I went in the kitchen. I took more pills, like a whole bottle. It makes sense now when I see there was, when I came back, there was an empty bottle on the, on the counter. Like things are making sense once he started to explain. And, you know, he told me about, you know, making me vomit, about calling my best friend. And I remember my best friend saying, yeah, things were really bad, but nobody gave me details. And so I think I was very upset in the therapy session of like, why didn't anyone say anything? But then at the same time, I thought like, wow, I really, I really wanted to die. and. It's amazing because, again, I am a therapist, so I know what to do. I know what to say. I help people. Uh, you know, that's my role in life. And But at this particular time in my life, I couldn't help myself. It humbles you. That's one thing I can say. It humbles you. If, if you think you have it all together, losing a child, a miscarriage will remind you of just how human and how fragile you are. I am very thankful that I did not complete suicide I you know as much as I question God I still want to be here you know it's only been about two months now but I no longer feel like I don't want to live and I thank God that I that I that I didn't get my wish because I I still have a lot to live for I still want to try and be a mom but I am dealing with a lot you know I'm back at work I ended up having to take some time off of work you know without pay because I was just mentally I could not do it and Ironically enough, at the time, I worked in suicide prevention. So I, I went back to work and I answered a call to the crisis line and this guy's on the phone and he's basically saying he's going through a divorce and he's hurting and he doesn't want to live. And in my mind, I wanted to say, yeah, I get it, but I couldn't. I'm at work. I'm supposed to help save lives, not encourage someone to complete suicide, but it was in that moment that I knew that I could not be at work. I ended up having an anxiety attack at work, so I had to go back to my psychiatrist, and she filled out the paperwork. And so I was off of work for about two weeks, didn't have enough leave, and so it was without pay. And, and for the first time in my life, I had to literally choose me. You know, I've I've always been, you know, I won't I wouldn't say money hungry or anything like that, but I just, you know, I was kind of raised. You get your career going, you're able to take care of yourself. That's what you do in life. And especially as a black woman, you make sure you can take care of yourself. You don't have to depend on anyone. So I've, I've never imagined not being able to work and, and not getting paid and, and not quite sure where the money was going to come from. But my friends and my family, they supported me and I had no choice. And one thing I, that was when I literally had to a hundred percent depend on God. I, I think we say that and we quote scriptures and we say God is in control. You know, it, it sounds wonderful, but there may come a point in your life where that has to be true. And for the first time in my life, I literally had to rely completely on God, rely that rely on God that he would have other people to take care of me because I could not, I couldn't do it. I could not go to work. I could not be super social worker and recover 
you know, I was still physically in pain, mentally in pain. And here I am at work trying to help someone else. It, no, it just, it just wasn't going to work. So that's basically the, the story of, of the loss and where I am and what happened. And, and for me, I think it's trying to deal with a miscarriage and a suicide attempt that, you know, it's been rough. I don't know. It's, I feel like, like why, why would I do that to myself? Go through a miscarriage and then on top of that, have to deal with being that low in life. But it happened and it happened for a reason. I hope that, you know, someone can hear my story and maybe they'll be able to relate and just know that it does get better. I'm only two months out, so I, I, I can't give this big ray of hope speech because I don't know, you know, it's some days I'm fine and some days I am not fine. I have a lot of anxiety now. Should I go on? I don't want to talk too much. No, no. Okay. I, you know, everything that you're saying is, you know, questions that I would ask. Today's episode is sponsored by the Consistency While Living in Limbo free webinar. Success doesn't come from what you do occasionally. It comes from what you do consistently. Grief, trauma, and loss can have a dramatic effect on lifestyle habits, and it can be challenging to maintain adequate nutrition, get regular exercise and physical activity, as well as sticking to a proper sleep schedule. This webinar is for you if you are not consistently getting the results you want to achieve success and go to the next level in your goals, relationships, marriage, partnerships, businesses, and career. This webinar is for you if you have been feeling stuck in your healing journey and want to move forward with consistent action. In this webinar, we will go through what is living in limbo, how grief, trauma, and loss shows up in our everyday lives through grief triggers, how do we manage them, and what tools can we use every day to remain consistent and show up even when we feel like giving up. Sign up today at bit.ly forward slash living in limbo. Once again, that is bit.ly forward slash L-I-V-I-N-G-I-N-L-I-M-B-O. Can't wait to see you all on this webinar on June the 25th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So tell us about really just kind of how you are navigating this role now that you're really, you're, you know, you, you took some time off at work, now you're back mm-hmm. at work and, mm-hmm. you know, there, there are triggers all around you. Yes. So how are you navigating that role so that you won't take yourself back to that place, to that dark, deep place that you were at? And talk well, about your, how your anxiety plays into that as well. Okay. Well, fortunately, it's it, the story is just like something you read out of a book. Three days after the miscarriage, I ended up doing a phone interview for another position. And amazingly, I felt like I did great in that interview. And then as soon as I hung up the phone, I boohooed. I cried. I cried. I don't know how I got myself together to do this interview. They called me that morning and said, can you interview at one o'clock this afternoon over the phone? I was like, yes. Um, so I did that. And while I'm at work for the school, when I'm working in suicide prevention, as I'm typing the email to say, I can't do this right now, I get a phone call and the position is offered to me. So I accept and I said, well, I'm going on FMLA. Is that going to be a problem? They're like, yeah, you know, you can start in two or three weeks. I'm like, okay. So even, even at my lowest, God still showed up. So I am still in, you know, the mental health field. I'm not directly working with suicide prevention anymore. I'm back to doing individual and group therapy. And so self-care is very important. I know that's, you know, very trendy now, very popular to say, but it's 100% truth for me. I have definitely learned the power in the word no. Like, no, I can't go out this weekend or, you know, no, I can't talk about your problems too. I'm having a rough day myself. I've definitely learned how to say no. I've definitely learned to speak up and to say, hey, I'm having a really rough day. My anxiety is is definitely different. I, I don't feel too comfortable around people for too long. Like if I go out, it's for a couple of hours. 
and then I'm ready to come back home. I, and I've been reading how that's normal because I didn't know if it's normal or not. I feel a lot safer around my mother or my boyfriend versus by myself. And I don't know what I, I don't know exactly what I fear, but that's just how it is for right now. And so, you know, and sometimes it'll hit. Sometimes I'm driving to work and I'll just burst out into tears. I'm like, where did that come from? Or, and I don't know, I know it sounds quote unquote crazy, but for a minute there, I would go on Instagram and look at like the pages with a lot of babies on it and try to find a baby that I thought that would look like me or my boyfriend trying to put a, a face to my child. That was the strangest thing that I would do, but I would do it. And, and I'm honest about it. And my, you know, my, I told my best friend and she was like, okay, we have to get you to stop doing this because you're literally torturing yourself. So I'm getting better with that. But for a while, I would do that every night. I would do that every night. And then I would send the pictures to my boyfriend and he would call and like, what are you doing? Go to, first of all, go to bed. And why are you up looking at baby pictures? But it was just, it was trying to make sense of it all. I did listen to when you had the online conference for women who, who've lost children. And I remember, you know, I don't know if it was you or someone else saying, you know, naming your child. We did get the remains tested. And so everything was fine. You know, with, with, with our, it was a boy so with our son's chromosomes. Everything was fine. So we did, you know, we decided to give him a name. And so at least I have a name for our child, but I don't have a face. And that, that still gets to me. I, I wonder every day, what, what would he look like? Would he look like me? Would it look like him? Would he have been tall? I'm, I'm assuming he would have been tall, but it, it, it still gets to me. I'm not, you know, I will never pretend like I'm completely okay and over it, that I don't have moments. And, you know, I remember my first cycle after the the miscarriage and just sobbing, just sobbing. Like I I thought I was going to have at least nine to 10 months (laughs) of not going through this anymore. And here we are again. So it's just, Self-care, just self-care and learning the word no and being okay with the no. And when someone goes, oh, girl, I mean, you can at least try. No. And if they can't understand, that's fine. That's okay. And I tell them all the time, well, be thankful that you don't know what this feels like. Be thankful that you have no idea what it's like to have a miscarriage, have a suicide attempt, have to go back to work and pick up your life and carry on and go help other people. and then try to still have friends and family. So I'm just, I'm very comfortable with the word no now, very comfortable with it. And and I'm becoming more comfortable with myself because you, like I said, that word no, sometimes it pushes people away. And then that's fine. I want anyone to who's listening, you know, it's fine. It's fine to say no. And if the people don't understand, then that's just how it is. Those who truly love you will understand. And they'll support you. They'll support the no. I, I had a really good friend who was having a baby shower and I just couldn't go. And I remember calling my best friend saying, am I not a good friend? And she's like, please don't go to that baby shower. Like it, send a gift and stay home. And that's what I did. And, and that's what I needed to do. I knew I, I shouldn't go to a baby shower and cry and, and take the attention off the mom. It, was, it should be a celebration, not people trying to contain my emotions. So I hope I haven't said too much, but that's, that's how I've, that's how I've been dealing with it. I, I do go to therapy. I still do that. I journal a lot. I journal a lot more. I am on antidepressants. I'm not ashamed of that. It's, it's what I do to keep, to function. I, I have to take, you know, anxiety for the night so I can sleep. I don't want that to be my life. I, I want to eventually get off the medication, but right now that's where I am. And so I'm doing what I have to do so that I can live and so that I can take care of myself. Absolutely. So thank you so much for sharing that and sharing kind of where you are now in your journey. So really, what do you think that besides, you know, really going to therapy and really taking your medication, really, what do you think also has helped you in on your grieving process? You know, any other tools or resources that you think you've used to help you? as you continue to grieve and, you know, kind of dismiss all of those suicidal intuitions that you've had, you know, kind of mm-hmm. what other things have you used that could help some other women out there that are very, very, very new in their grief as well? Having friends, having friends who, you know, who understand helps, you know, people to call and still check on you. 
to let you know that, you know, you're still loved, you know, that they've always loved you for you. And so that, that definitely helped, you know, and I've, I've, you know, there's some people who will surprise me. I feel like they haven't reached out or, and that's fine too. Again, it's, it's a process and those who are meant to stay, they, they do that. They stay. So friends have definitely helped. My partner has definitely helped. He's been a great support. Yet it was difficult for him, especially in the beginning with my suicide attempt. You know, he shut down. It was rough. I wasn't sure if we were going to make it. But once we got through that hurdle, I feel like we've become even closer. So I would say, you know, having good people around you helps. Understanding people. Again, like I said, I journal a lot because sometimes I don't want to always talk to someone. I just want to get the feelings out. So I just kind of I write them and however it comes out, it comes out. I pray a lot, a lot. I've had to pray a lot. And I've also had to dig deep and find the the lessons that came through being pregnant, through the miscarriage, through the suicide attempt. You know, I I had to dig deep. I've had to I had to really look and see how God has still blessed. That's the best way I can put it, is is digging deep. The journaling, the therapy, the friends, the crying. I give myself space to cry. I don't always feel so comfortable with it because, you know, I, like I said, I was strong and I'm the helper. So now I need help. It's just a little different. But I, I grieve. And I think that's something that we have to remember that it is OK to grieve. It's OK to not have a good day. It's OK to call off from work. It's OK to cancel plans. It's okay to lay in bed and eat ice cream and then say, okay, girl, you've done this enough. Go take a shower. But definitely giving myself space to grieve has, is, is, is helping me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what encouraging words can you leave the mom out there who has had a miscarriage and they are in the process to try again? Whew. Well, as I said, I'm new. I'm new to this. It's only been about two months. As for encouraging words, I think I would just say it's okay if 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 the the mom isn't sure that she wants to try again. Maybe on Monday, at least that's how I am. Like on Monday, yes, I want to try again. And on Wednesday, I'm like, I don't want to ever do this again. I don't ever want to go through that pain again. So because I'm so new, I would think if I would talk to a mom who wants to try again, I would just say, give yourself room. Give yourself space to, you know, maybe some days you feel like it and some days you, you, you won't. And that's OK. It's OK to feel how you feel. And then I'll also say go for it. I feel like if, if that's a desire of your heart, you know, with you and your, your spouse or your partner, go for it. I know it hurts. I, I know it's nerve wracking and, and, and it's anxiety provoking, but you can't you won't become a mom in that way unless you try. You just can't wake up and boom, there's baby. You have to try. And and what I do is is I try to, to to focus on the beautiful outcome. Like, yes, it could happen again, sure. Or maybe it won't and I'll have a beautiful, healthy baby. And I think that's what the, the, the mom would have to tell herself. Like, acknowledge it. Like it's scary. It, yeah. But you're never gonna know unless you try again. It's easy to give into the fear, but if you've come this far, then why not keep going? And there's probably been something else in life that you thought you would never make it through. And it was so painful and, and that was going to be the end of you. And you woke up the next morning and that wasn't true. And so that's what I would tell a, a, a woman trying to try again, a couple, because that's what I tell myself. Like, OK, I could give into this fear and I could not try again. But then what? Then the story is over. I'm not ready for it to be over. And so I'm praying and hoping that other women out there too will will tell themselves that they're not ready for this story for the story to be over. Absolutely. So thank you so much for sharing your story and sharing thank your you. heart. Where can we find you on social for those who want to connect with you after this episode? Ah, uh, you can I can I give an email address? Sure. You can do email. Okay. We'll put that okay. in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I would say maybe an email address because um I like my social media is kind of private. I don't go by my real name because of the, the line of work that I'm in. And so sometimes I would have clients try to find me. And so no. <laughs> no. So I have to kind of be discreet on social media. But my email is 
C, justice, C as in cat, and that's justice, J-U-S-T-I-C-E, L-C-S-W at Comcast.net. So again, that's C, justice, L-C-S-W at Comcast.net. And anybody, you know, can reach me there. And like I said, my social media has to be private because I do work for the government. And I've had clients find me and, you know, hey, girl, I'm like, no, 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 oh, no. So, but yeah, I would love to, for anyone to reach out to me if they want to talk or chat. I mean, I need it as well. Like I said, I'm just two months into this, but I remember telling God that if I had a chance to tell my story after, you know, making it through that suicide attempt, that I would. And then I come across your page and I was like, okay, God, I hear you. I'll do it. I told you I'll do it. And said I'll do it. Awesome. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I know that this is going to definitely help heal and free some women who have gone through something similar for sure. I hope so. so. I will make sure that I put her email in the description box. And then for those of you all, we're going to get her to, to try to join our Facebook group so she can be in our Facebook group as well. <laughs> yes, I would love <laughs> to do that. Thank you so much. Crystal thank Ford. you so much. I just want to thank okay. you for your platform. Thank you for what you do. You. I don't even know if you understand how big of a blessing you are. I, I'm so serious because I was lost. I've had friends that have miscarriages, but it's just different when it's you. It's just completely different. So I just want to thank you and just God bless you. You are a, you're an angel. You are an absolute angel. Thank you so much for this platform. Thank you so much for thank sharing you. that. And I, I thank you. Well, that, that just touches my heart. Let me know to keep on going. Please God, do. Yeah, keep on going. God is going to continue to bless people with the yes. you're doing. Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you are definitely a blessing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I pray that this show was inspirational and a blessing to you. For show notes, visit ericaandmcafee.com forward slash podcast. Please join us in our offline discussions in our private Facebook group by going to sistersinloss.com. If you're listening in Apple Podcasts, please rate and subscribe to us and leave us a five-star review. I pray that you all have a blessed week. Keep the faith and I'll talk to you next Wednesday. If you and your team want to cut down on busy work and get more choice and control over accounts payable, you need Bill. Bill Accounts Payable is your secret weapon for saving time on AP. And with a special offer at bill.com slash podcast, you'll save money too. With Bill, streamline your entire AP process, including bill creation, approvals, and payments. You can pay with ACH, credit card, check, and international wire transfer. Plus, you can easily integrate with most accounting software. No wonder hundreds of thousands of businesses are already using Bill to manage their AP. Schedule a free demo now to see how Bill can automate your financial operations. And right now, get 15% off when you subscribe to Bill Accounts Payable. There's never been a better time to sign up. This special offer is available for a limited time only at bill.com slash podcast. Terms apply. See bill.com slash podcast for details.